B, self-alienated spirit, culture. Let's first summarize how spirit's self-alienation will be overcome. Recall that spirit or reason is all reality, subject and object at once. Therefore, to achieve this is to have overcome alienation and finally to be at home in the world. There are two basic types of alienation. One, the self as alienated from the actual present world. And two, the dual alienation resulting from the medieval world split into this actual world and the beyond. Spirit, the self, tries to overcome the first type of alienation by culture, by cultivating itself for a station and role within the world's institutions and values of politics, courtly life, and commerce making money. This method fails when the disrupted hippie consciousness sees through the hypocrisy of these values and lifestyles, the world of culture then collapsing. This leads to the second type of alienation, with the actual world of culture in ruins, no longer a viable game or life pursuit, spirit turns to its pure consciousness as a way out in two forms. It turns outside itself as a faith in a beyond and turns inside itself as a pure insight and enlightenment which regards the self or reason as everything. But reason cannot realize itself as all reality and overcome alienation so long as reality is split into two, a here and a beyond. So it directs all its efforts to eliminating faith, which by the way is not religion per se, and which it succeeds in doing. Enlightenment and insight then become utility, the self and the will becoming all in all. The end of alienation is implicitly achieved. That is, we have a universal will, but individuality, being for self, is lacking. This leads to the French Revolution and a one-sided absolute freedom. All alienation is finally overcome when spirit becomes certain of itself in morality and conscience, when full individuality and unity with universality is realized and the reciprocal recognition of acting UI and judging UI consciences is achieved. One. The world of self-alienated spirit. Spirit is now alienated from its world, its substance. Quote, The world has the character of being something external, the negative of self-consciousness. End quote. Yet the self knows the world is implicitly itself since the world is the result of the self's own externalization, the work of each and all. The self or the individual, as an absolutely discrete unit, will now attempt to overcome its alienation from the actual world confronting it. A, culture and its realm of actuality. In short, medieval feudal society's realm of actuality divides itself into state power and wealth, the world of culture, Bildung. The cultivated individual must choose which sphere to work and serve in. 
It turns out that since neither sphere is a viable concern, the world of culture collapses and we are forced to transition to faith and pure insight. Here, one's culture alone matters. What you make of yourself, you only have standing in society if you are cultivated and educated. It is the individual that chooses and defines her role and profession in society, in contrast to Greek and to Roman society, where one has standing in the latter merely by being a person with rights. The dialectic here has four moments. One, the cultivated individual must choose which objective sphere she is to serve in, state power, politics, or wealth, money-making. And to this end, she uses the value judgments of good and bad to help her decide. However, she soon learns that both are equally good and bad, hence negate themselves. The cultivated individual's first judgment is that state power is good, the sphere it should choose to work in, because it represents the general, the universal interest, and is there to help everyone. Whereas wealth, or making money, since it concerns only the interests and ends of the individual, is bad and not to be chosen. Also important, is that in choosing the good to be the state power, the individual puts itself in identity with this object, thus becoming all reality. While the reverse is true regarding wealth as bad, as the individual then remains separated and alienated from the object. Two, but things are then reversed. On second thought, it realizes that it is rather wealth that is good because it helps the individual meet his daily needs and helps him to benefit others, whereas state power is bad since it is indifferent and in fact alien and oppressive to individuality as such. Three. The cultivated individual next uses the value judgments of noble and ignoble, or base, to help in its decision. The noble person is one who sees state power and wealth as both good, whereas the base person is one who sees state power and wealth as both bad. This solution and dichotomy also cannot be upheld. As Hegel says, the noble person's heroism of service becomes the haughty vassal, always on the point of revolt, who cannot really be in service to his lord and the state, and is thus ignoble or base. The result so far is that state power and wealth are equally good and bad, and there is also no difference between the noble and the base person. The base is noble, the noble base. Four, finally, in an effort to save the noble base distinction, we advance next to the court of the Sun King, Louis XIV, to the individual monarch who has absolute power, l'état C'est moi. As the state is now embodied in an individual, instead of a plurality of feudal lords, the monarch is now someone with whom the noble, the noble person, can identify, see himself in, and serve wholeheartedly. But this changes when the nobles realize it is they themselves by their constant language of flattery and use of the monarch's name, 
who are the real power behind the monarch, who they begin to despise when he becomes a despot and a dispenser of wealth, and who, as Hegel says, quote, in this arrogance fancies it has, by the gift of a meal, acquired the self of another's eye, end quote. Thus, <clears throat> here again, quote, the distinction within its spirit of being noble as opposed to ignoble falls away, and both are the same, end quote. The result is that the cultivated individual's value judgments on power and wealth, good and bad, noble and base, are all contradictory and have no truth power and wealth no longer being viable games or concerns. The actual objective world of culture has now disintegrated, and this finds expression in the disrupted consciousness, which though torn in two by the world, is nevertheless one with itself. Quote, absolutely self-identical, in its absolute disruption. Hegel feels Rameau's nephew by Denis Diderot perfectly captures this historical denouement and mindset, confirming that the real world is a soulless existence, that all values are vanity and hypocrisy. Here's a brief excerpt. the nephew of the musician Rameau. It's all vanity. Ha! Huh. What you should do is drink good wine, blow yourself out with luscious food, have a tumble with lovely women, lie on soft beds. Apart from that, the rest is vanity, Diderot. What? Fighting for one's country? Vanity. There's no such thing left. From pole to pole, all I can see is tyrants and slaves. Helping one's friends? Vanity. Have we got any friends? And if we had, we should make them ungrateful. Have a look around you, and you'll see that that is what you always get for service rendered. Gratitude is a burden and all burdens are meant to be shaken off. Having a position in society and fulfilling its duties? Vanity, what does it matter whether you have a position or not, so long as you're rich, since you only take a position to get rich? Fulfilling your duties? <laughs> Where does that get you? Into jealousy, upsets, persecution, is that the way to get on? Butter people up. Good God, butter them up. Watch the great, study their tastes, fall in with their whims, pander to their vices, approve of their crimes. That's the secret. Seeing to the upbringing of one's children? Vanity. That's the teacher's job. And so on. B, faith and pure insight. After the collapse of the actual world of culture, there are only two ways left to go to find reconciliation. Outside the world to another world, a supersensuous heavenly beyond the way of faith or pure consciousness, or inside oneself the self or reason being everything, all reality, the way of pure insight or pure self-consciousness. The self here is not the particular, but the universal self. Again, faith here, Hegel notes, is not religion. Faith is a flight from the actual world. True religion is not. 
Faith also involves alienation since the believer lives in the actual world. That is, quote, its pure consciousness is alienated from its actual consciousness, end quote, which regards its own actuality as something worthless and to be overcome. Here, I will just quote three absolutely important passages of Hegel which give a direct insight into absolute knowledge and which, to my knowledge, are also never quoted in the literature. Quote, Here we have the certainty that at once knows itself to be the truth, pure thought as the absolute concept in the might of its negativity which eliminates everything objective that supposedly stands over against consciousness and makes it into a being which has its origin in consciousness, end quote. And, quote, pure insight knows essence as the absolute self, or I of Fichte, and thus seeks to abolish every kind of independence other than that of self-consciousness and give it the form of the concept. Pure insight is not only the certainty of self-conscious reason that it is all truth, it knows that it is, end quote. Lastly, very important, quote, the absolute concept is the category in which knowing and the object of knowing are the same, end quote. When pure insight becomes widespread, it becomes the enlightenment. And thus Hegel concludes, quote, this pure insight is the spirit that calls to every consciousness, be for yourself what you are in yourselves, reason or reasonable, end quote. 